me, uh, let me introduce first. We have Jabe Bloom. Uh, he's our first speaker. He writes at blog.jabebloom.com. He tweets as at Saitane. You can uh, click on his Twitter on the uh, DevOps Days uh, page for this event, so you uh, don't have to spell that out. So uh, Jabe is pursuing a PhD in design at CNN. Actually, you should take an opportunity to talk with him about it, because it, it's a, there's a lot more depth to it. Apparently, uh, it's the first program where you can get a PhD in design in the United States, and uh, he has some interesting insights into that. Um, he is a chief flow officer at Praxis Flow, the company he formed with Kevin Baer in 2014. I think most of you will know who Kevin is, and, and uh, so um, that may be of interest to you as well. Um, his talk, as you can see, is on complexity science, and so without further ado, uh, if Jay, uh, come on up, and everyone please welcome him. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Is the mic on? Yes, it is. It is. Excellent. Um, so I've been to a DevOps days before, but I've never spoken at one. Um, so this is my first one. I'm excited. Um, my inner anthropologist is particularly excited uh, to be in a culture that's obsessed with culture. It's kind of like a recursive excitement. Uh, so uh, my talk is on complexity science. Um, two really incredibly problematic words. Uh, that Dave asked me to put together for you. Uh, so uh, I think it's an interesting framing, and uh, I'm going to try to do my best to explain uh, both words relatively well, I think. Um, I'm going to start in a very strange place uh, related to my research uh, as a PhD student, and uh, the first place I want to start is this. So this is the, uh, this is the god Kronos, Greek god Kronos. Um, you will see Kronos uh, looks a lot like death, or what we would call uh, Father Time. Um, so he has a nice little hourglass and a uh, sickle. Uh, Kronos is uh, highly uh, related to mechanical time, so that's why he's got this this um, this sand uh, timer, and he also uh, is related to beginnings and endings. So the sickle is about harvest. It's both about planting and uh, harvesting, right? So uh, in this way, he uh, almost idealizes the concept of kind of mechanistic science, uh, the relationship between beginnings and endings, causality, things like this. Um, throughout the talk, uh, I will be contrasting him with Karyos. So um, Karyos is, uh, is the youngest of the gods in the Greek pantheon, and um, he represents opportune time, the, the moment of decisive decisions, the moment of making a decision in the moment. Um, so whereas uh, Kronos is kind of quantitative, um, Karyos is very qualitative, and the nature of, of the decisions that you make when you're in the presence of karyos are very decisive, they're permanent, they fracture uh, the way that you're thinking. Um, this is represented nicely by, um, he's holding a, a scale on a knife blade, is kind of his thing, uh, representing kind of like that decisiveness. And he's also got a very long lock on the front of his head. You're supposed to seize the day, uh, carpe diem, and this is where that comes from, is this lock on the front of his head. You're supposed to seize karyos. Um, so time, uh, which are both, these gods are both time gods um, in the Greek pantheon, there's two of them, um, is intrinsically interrelated in complexity. Um, and that's a lot of my research. So complexity itself is, is a terrible word uh, to try to define. I'm going to have to spend an, an inordinate amount of time at the beginning of this trying to explain it. But, Let's just start with a very simple version of what complexity might be. So if I took a normal pendulum and I swung it, it would swing back and forth. And the possible locations of the pendulum on a single point pendulum are in a straight or a curved line, that the entire phase space is here, right? So the phase space means all the possible points that the system can reach. So a single pendulum is a very simple system. It has a very small phase space. What differentiates a double pendulum, which is what you're watching right now, from a single pendulum is largely the amount of phase space that it can cover. So in other words, the uh, blue line in particular uh, has, covers a, a lot of space. It, it can go in a lot of different directions. 
Um, and the result of this is that whenever you have a system that is even this simplistic, right, so it's only two pendulums interrelated, um, it can create a, what, what would be called a chaotic system. So it's impossible to know where the pendulum, the blue pendulum, will go next. It's also impossible to know where the red pendulum will go next because it's being driven by the interaction with the, with the blue pendulum. Yeah? So complexity uh, in this way is, o is only the difference between one system and another system interacting with it. Just, just one more system causes this much complexity, right? And in fact, uh, this particular system is, is what we would call a chaotic system. Um, it it uh, requires you, if you'd like to know how it will play out, you have to actually let it play out. Time has to occur in order for you to see the result. One more little thing about time, and then we'll go on to the next little piece. Um, I think this is particularly interesting for um, developers and operators, right? So the more complex a system is, the more the system is like that pendulum, um, the longer the effects of its results can stay hidden in time. So one of the reasons we prefer as developers and um, off people simple systems is because it closes the cause effect gap, right? A simpler system actually has less time between what the cause and the effect. The more complex the system gets, the more that the system could have a cause that has a long duration until the effect, and this causes a significant problem because we actually have a hard time as humans correlating long distance cause and effect. It's a really big problem, right? Um, so time uh, not only causes complexity, which is kind of, we'll get into some of the, the ways that complexity is, but it also causes this particularly uh, difficult form of cognition, which is noting something that happened a week ago is causing a result a week later and actually noticing that those two things are correlated. Very difficult to do. Uh, and the more complex the system is, the more likely that is to happen. So complexity itself, the word complexity in science is, uh, is very tricky. Um, there's a lot of different meanings to it. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time making sure that I don't decapitate myself in front of you. Um, I need to, um, to, to walk through some of the definitions of complexity so you guys have a, a good idea of it. Now, all of you should, uh, after this, read Mark's uh, uh, description of complexity, uh, which is here. Um, and note that my version of complexity is not his version of complexity, right? So his version of complexity is, is very um, science, physics based. And that's great. Um, it's not what I'm going to talk about today, although I'll talk about parts of it. Uh, my version of it is much more from the social sciences. And uh, you should read his uh, blog post only, if only to know why some people object to the way that I describe complexity. So I think it's important. So first of all, complexity, the word complexity um, is calm, it's width, and it's uh, lecture, and it's, so this means entwined. So this is the complexity you almost always have to think of as being the way that parts are kind of intermingled together and inseparable. They, you can't kind of take them apart. Um, and there's different ways uh, that, that to think about that entwinement and the parts. But in general, uh, complexity theory uh, is the uh, study of the muriology, right? So the relationship between parts and holes. Um, and the way that those uh, parts become holes and, the, and uh, behave as non-deterministic systems uh, that evolve dynamically over time. So that's one definition. The kind of more vernacular definition of complexity is, is best described as complexity versus simplicity, right? So this is uh, any developer who who's said, like, keep it simple, stupid, right? This is the complexity that we're talking about there, right? So this is complexity as in it's bad because I can't understand it. The interface is too cluttered, right? And it's too complex to understand what it's doing. A lot of work is done around this uh, in, in human computer interfaces and in human interaction. Um, so the way that those groups of people talk about uh, complexity is called cognitive complexity. 
in the HCI tradition, this is studied, and what it is is this literally the study of cognitive load in using a system. That's what they mean by complexity. The higher the cognitive load is, the more complex it is. In other words, the system is requiring you to think a lot, which means it's more complex. So this is another version of complexity. Both of them have something to do with the fact that there's a lot of parts, and, it, and it's hard to think about those parts, right? Um, there's another version of complexity that is much more less, um, it, it's also about kind of cognition and thinking, but it is less about kind of um, uh, in, uh, looking at a, uh, an object or an interface. Uh, wicked problems, and this is more from the kind of social uh, sciences, uh, so uh, Horace Riddle uh, came up with this idea. And his idea of wicked problems is roughly that whenever we look at a problem, the first thing we try to do uh, if we're taking a, a science frame of mind is we try to untangle the problem and find the parts and then solve all the individual parts, right? And so this is the way that, that science uh, attempts to solve many problems. So for Riddle, he's saying, in social systems, one of the problems is you literally just can't take the system apart. You can't find the edges well enough to actually define them as being separate. So if you've ever done any systems thinking, um, and you've ever had an argument with someone who does the uh, it's turtles all the way down move on you of infinite regress, where they, you say, uh, the boundary of the system is here, and they say, why? And then all of a sudden, the system is the universe, right? Um, this is the wicked problem. This is the problem that you can't, you, in, in order to think in systems thinking, you need to have basically an agreement to, to play fair, right? You have to have an agreement that we can have boundaries, right? So the wicked problem is that that, that can't happen deterministically, right? You can't deterministically say, here's the way the social system is bounded, right? And there's all sorts of interesting issues with that. Uh, Alicia Geraro's The Problems with Identity in Complex Systems is an excellent paper on that. I love it. Um, so then we kind of move on to kind of the more towards uh, Mark Burgess's ideas, uh, cybernetics, general system theory, information theory, and tur Turing machines, right? So Norbert Wiener uh, comes up with this idea that of cybernetics. <coughs> Generally, uh, you have a thermostat, feedback loop, yay, you can control things, right? Um, and so this feedback loop is part of complexity, right? Like the system is feeding back on itself, it becomes more and more complex in some ways. Then we get general system theory, which I just briefly described. And the two other ones that are quite interesting and uh, are interrelated are information theory and Turing machines, both of which have ways of thinking about complexity, right? So one way you could mathematically determine the complexity of something is the cost uh, in Turing machine time of solving that problem, right? So the, the longer it takes to solve a problem, the more computationally complex it is, yes? So that's one way of measuring it. Information theory, uh, the more complex a message that you can send through a particular system, uh, the, the, it has to do with whether or not the system has uh, enough variability in it to actually send the message. It's also interesting to play with. I have the same slide twice, isn't that exciting? Um, finally, uh, or not finally, but getting there, uh, after this in the 70s, we get uh, the concept of chaos theory. Um, so chaos theory, uh, Lorenz and Mandelbrot, this is uh, behind you is the Lorenz butterfly. Uh, the Lorenz butterfly, you should kind of think of like that pendulum that I started with. It's the same kind of idea, right? Uh, there, there, there's a pattern here, right? It seems to be moving in the general shape of a butterfly, but each path is unique and it is non-deterministic in, in itself. Um, Lorenz uh, noticed this very strange thing when he was playing with systems. So, does anybody know what the law of large numbers is? Yeah. Law of large numbers says, if I'm looking at a star from the Earth, and I'm trying to figure out what it, where it is in the sky, the best way to figure out where it is is to have multiple reference points, right? And it, the averages cause bit more accuracy, right? So this is generally the way that science thinks about most things, or did before complexity theory, which was if you start with a small variation of different numbers, eventually they'll average out and give you the right number. So we always think of kind of converging at this point. 
What Lorenz noticed was he could do certain things with certain types of systems. They're called nonlinear systems where they would diverge instead of converge, even the smallest starting parameters. So this is called uh, high sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, and this is what causes what, what they call deterministic chaotic systems, uh, which are also uh, an interesting form of uh, complexity. Finally, uh, two more. And then we can move on. Uh, ecological uh, and natural biological systems. Uh, there, we had, so we've done kind of um, computation, uh, human user interface, uh, uh, computational complexity, um, and, uh, and social complexity. This is another form of complexity that gets talked about a lot. You'll notice the language. Uh, probably you've seen this language in if you've done any agile things. Um, this comes from biologists trying to apply these ideas. Um, and the ideas that kind of pop up in this community are self-organization, autoquiesis, adaptation, and emergence. A lot of these ideas actually slide their way into um, the pattern language book, which then becomes maybe the initial, uh, one of the original bibles for uh, architects, uh, uh, both in software and uh, architect architectes. So all of these ideas are also complexity ideas. Finally, we get bounded, rationa bounded rationality and computational complexity. So Herbert Simon um, defined bounded rationality as the idea that, OK, if we are looking at, at riddleish systems, so if we're looking at wicked systems, and we can't disentangle them, we still have to make decisions. So we're bounded in the amount of time and information we can extract from that system. So we're just going to have to satisfy, right? So we just have to make a reasonably good decision. Um, and this encourages, because it's about kind of a temporal concept, right? In other words, you only have a certain amount of time to make a good decision. It becomes a race to make faster and faster computers. Because if you can make the computer go faster and you can feed the information into the computer, then you can actually solve more complex problems, right? And so computational complexity ends up being looking like a big blue beating a, uh, a chess master, right? That is what this form of complexity is, uh, computational complexity. Um, also a different kind of complexity than, for instance, the wicked problems complexity or the social complexity. So in the end of all that, there's a contentious fractional nature to the, the, the dialectics of complexity. Um, the definition of complexity remains highly contentious. Um, there are multiple scientific attempts to uh, quantify complexity, the amount of complexity in a system. Um, you can see social science, design, um, biology, all uh, interacting and trying to define it in different ways. Concept of agency, self-similarity, creativity, evolution, ecosystems are all engaged by both naturalists and complexity theorists. And additionally, complexity is taken up by researchers of cognition, linguistics, and ecu which echo the uh, computational and epistemological uh, approaches to complexity defined both by computer scientists and by philosophers. In other words, it's a big mess, right? <laughs> if you guys want to help me, you can go here. Uh, this is a live document. You can comment on it. All the stuff I just said is in that document. Um, Please uh, feel free to go and help me uh, disentangle this some more. So how do you like work with any of these ideas? Like what, 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 what do we do when we talk to people about complexity to make complexity useful, right? Um, the first thing is that uh, things are not just intertwined at like a pile of sand, OK? There's a difference between an aggregation and a system, right? So an aggregation is just a pile of things. A system is something that gets more value because it's together, right? So one of the things you can say about teams or people uh, initially is that uh, an aggregate concept of humans would be to say, you're all little computers, right? And I put you in a team so I have more computing power on, the, on a problem, right? That, that would be an aggregation, right? A system would be to say, you're not really computers. You all are working together. And in fact, as a team, you are able to achieve something you would not be able to achieve by yourself, right? Not just more computational power, but actual a different kind of thinking, right? And so in this way, 
what you do as a team uh, when you take a complexity frame of mind is that you make meaning together by interacting together. That's what you're doing as a team, right? And this making meaning uh, is what we call sense making. Um, and just to flip right back to the beginning, this is karyos, right? This is knowledge at a particular moment in time, right? Um, so, uh, Brenda Durbin uh, talks about this quite a bit. And when we try to make sense of things, this is, these are the types of questions we're trying to answer, right? We're trying, how do we make sense of the world so we can act in it? Uh, what process do people use to give meaning to experience? Um, how is action inform, informed um, by what emerges from the constraints of the system? So this is Durbin's model of sense making. She basically says, that when you approach a situation that has a lot of complexity in it, I have to figure out how to understand this. Um, you are in a situation with a history that has a past, right? You're not coming into it like a, uh, a CPU waiting for instructions. You will have some way of thinking about how you got there. Um, and you have some goal, uh, and you try to make a bridge by making ideas and cognitions and things like that. Um, and the bridge is over a gap about confusions and riddles and what you're angsty about. And this is what she calls sense making. I also love that clearly she made this in MS Paint. This <laughs> is <laughs> <laughs> a, a famous diagram. I just think it's awesome. So, who knows what this is? Oh boy, okay. All right, so this is what we call Kanevin. Kanevin, it's a, it's a Welsh word. Um, Here's the trick. Kenevin uses three words that most people use to mean the same thing. So I will ask you not to spend too much time thinking about the words. I'm going to give you experiential versions of them. Um, Kenevin means uh, the place of my multiple belongings, which is a terrible definition. Um, it's a Welsh word. <laughs> what, what it, what I, the way I describe it is if you go back home, you go to high school, where you went to high school, and you kind of get near high school and you feel like a pressure on your chest and you feel like the rules are changing. Like, oh wait, like I should act differently right now, right? So it is a geographically bounded role that you feel, right? That is literally what a Kinevin is. It's a space in which you feel like the rules have changed. One of the ways you can experience it that's a little bit less powerful, I think, but just I, when I come to work, I feel like I should act some way. And when I go home, I feel like I should act some way. And I feel like I act differently in both those places. Right? That's, that is what a Kinevin is. So the Kinevin model it attempts to explain some ways that feel, so make sense, sense of the world. Right? And the first is this, ordered versus unordered. Uh, there's on the left-hand side, uh, left-hand side, right, left. Right? Um, ordered. Ordered is the way most people think about the world. It is cause and effect. It is, if I do this, I expect this result. And I expect it to happen repeatedly, right? So uh, unordered is, I don't really know what will happen if I do this. I'm going to poke the system, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. And not only that, but sometimes when I poke it, it doesn't do the same thing again. Yes? Ordered, unordered. Simple, also called obvious. So when you think about this domain, when you think about what this feels like in your head, you think calling Comcast because your router is down. <laughs> and they run you through a script and you say to them on the phone repeatedly, I know it's not that. <laughs> and they refuse to go off script. And you go, okay. Yes, I have unplugged it. Yes, totally did that. Right. <laughs> right? That is the sensation of simplistic, sim simple or obvious, right? Someone believes that they have created a script that will answer any question. It's completely mechanistic, right? They are actually turning humans into little machines down here, right? Um, complicated. Complicated feels like uh, when I have, uh, look at my Honda uh, engine, 
and it's sealed. And I am sure that someone can fix that engine, but I'm sure I can't. <laughs> right? That's, that is the feeling of complicated. It's this, this feeling like, I know there is an answer to this. I know somebody understands it. I don't. Yeah. I just need to find the right person to understand it. That's complicated, OK? Uh, classic things that happen here is simple, have very short um, uh, cause and effect boundaries. Uh, complicated gets longer. Um, things like jet engines are highly complicated. To me, they look really complex, right? Because I have no idea how they work. However, they deliver people all over the planet very, very regularly, right? So they're, in fact, highly deterministic. Yeah? I have a question. Yeah? Uh, you say that, for example, uh, your, your Honda engine is yeah. complex because you can understand it. Complicated. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So does it mean that it doesn't fall into the complicated category for someone who is? That's right. So this is this is a, uh, a me, personal. personal yep. Yeah, yeah. So he's asking, it would the engineer think of it as being a complicated problem? Yeah, but but then you but then you related that to the cause and effect like chain length, yeah. and but the cause and effect chain length is the same whoever looks at it, right? Yeah. So. Yes, the cause and effect chain would, it, generally what it, the answer is that even if you go to someone who really knows this, A, they will tend to think it is more obvious, right, because they will have a lot of experience with it, but they will likely have to do some analysis, right? They'll go, oh, these are the possible problems, and I'm going to determine exactly which one of these it, it is, but I'm going to have to look at your engine for a little while, right? It's not like a bicycle chain is what we use down here. Like you bring a bicycle and you're like, dude, the chain's not on the like. <laughs> <laughs> so it isn't entirely like persona related. It, it, so it is a it tends to be a unique ontological epistemological experience. Yes. So it is a way that you know about things, and often, especially in software engineering, different people will be in different domains at the same time. It's one of the problems that happens. Some people will literally say either A, I would like this to be treated as simple. In other words, I don't give a shit, just do it. <laughs> right? And, and as opposed to some people who are like, well, no, this, is, this could be really complex, which I'll show you next, right? So like, there, one of the negotiations that often happens in teams when you're using a model like this is, which domain are we operating in right now? Like, there may be a right way to look at it in relation to the the cause and effects chains would yeah. be that the, when someone has said something better, the chains that tend to like compact yeah. because they see like that something that would be a long chain for someone else That's right. as a single chain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like, one of the ways of measuring, I think, especially in the software development and operations that we do, is anything that causes the temporality to shrink or allows us to link cause and effect better. One of those two makes it more obvious. Yes? And that's good. In general, especially for like anybody who has a, like nine nines or something. Um, complex. So the sensation of complex is this uh, on the tip of my tongue, right? Like I can almost get, I can't quite get it, but it's the, I know that if I think long enough, I'm going to get it, right? So the sense of it is that not that you don't know what's happening, is that you kind of know what's happening. Does that make sense? So complexity is emergent, right? Something, if you think about it long enough, something is going to emerge, right? And that is, that is what complexity is. It feels like that. I, if I invest more time in it, I'm going to figure it out. So, um, yeah? But complexity itself is all subjective, is what you're saying, based on all four of these kinds of theories, that regardless of who you are, the, the, what will be complex to one person, say, in software engineering? Yeah. Maybe old hat. Yep. So there's two ways of looking at this. One, yes, multiple people might think different things are complex, right? Sure. So uh, I'm not very good at, at crossword puzzles. Somebody else might be. I might think a lot of words are kind of like, ah, I almost got it. I can't quite fit. Right? I would think it's complex. Other people will be like, I solved that in 10 minutes. So there's, there's, there is that. The other thing that you want to do with this model is basically figure out where, as a team, do you want to operate? Literally. Do you want to treat this like it's a complex problem? Do you want to treat this like we don't quite know what the answer is, we should explore some more? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to treat it like a complicated problem? We have a list of what the problems could be, we need to analyze it, and we'll give you a schedule for doing that, and we'll be done, and you don't have to worry about it, go away, right? The differences between these things are significant. Um, and that's what we're trying to kind of get people to think about. Chaotic. 
So chaotic is every space movie when they, the astronaut gets blasted out and is floating in space and they're reaching and trying to grab onto something. That's, that is what chaotic feels like because chaotic is the lack of connections. That's what it is. It's, I can't actually get purchase on anything to move in any direction. So the feeling of chaos as it kind of epistemologically, uh, you know, as you're thinking, is I can't get a grip on it. Yes? So, there are, for teams, because I think this is useful for devop people, there are, th these are the ways you can look at this. This is simple, complicated, complex, uh, and chaotic. Uh, in a chaotic system, first, don't do this in general. But uh, none, of, none of the actors are interacting with each other, right? So literally, the dotted lines mean they're not strongly connected anyway. So a chaotic team feels like nobody's talking to each other, or feels like nobody can talk to each other, because they don't have the right language yet to talk to each other. That's what a chaotic team feels like. An ordered team has two different ways of operating. Obvious is the boss man, or uh, the, uh, the, the uh, manual, says what to do to the people, right? So it says, just do this, and this problem will be solved. And you'll note that the people don't talk to each other, right? Because there's no reason to talk, because there's already an answer, right? This is also highly problematic. It causes that, uh, that li it literally says to people, don't think. And that's bad, in general. <laughs> Telling people not to think is a bad idea. Uh, complicated. This is a bunch of experts who have their own language together, and a boss who doesn't share that language but has, an, has a goal. So we can go to the experts and say, hey, this is what I want to get done. So he's in control a little bit, but he's not telling them the exact way of getting there. And finally, complex. Complex is where the boss man uh, goes to a group of highly connected experts and, and really loosens the reins and says, Generally, I want you to explore over there in that area, but I have no solution yet. Often this is used, the way you do this is, this guy states a problem and says nothing about what the solution might be. Just, this is a problem. You guys go fix it however you want, yes? Um, all right, so here are the very quick uh, end versions of this. Uh, the way to do complex work is to have everyone retain freedoms within specific boundaries. Constrain people appropriately. The way you can tell if it's working or not is un overly unconstrained teams stop acting because they don't feel safe. There's not enough kind of constraint to make them move, right? Over constrained teams stop acting because they can't figure out which rules to follow. They're gonna get screwed one way or another because they're going to have to break some rule, right? That's over constraint. Uh, different domains, so the ones that I show you, those different feelings require different ways of knowing. Context matters, and good leaders are uh, capable of figuring out what domain they want the team to operate in. Beware of complexity bias or, or complexity fetishism, right? So like complexity is just one of the domains. You don't always want to operate in complexity. It's incredibly expensive to be in complexity. Um, you don't want to stay there or you will starve to death. Uh, best practices are by definition past practice, right? So you actually want to move stuff out of obvious and into complicated and complex in order to rejuvenate it every once in a while. Um, New, uh, new knowledge requires re-examination of current constraints, so literally trying to figure out what the team is reacting to and changing those constraints is how you actually create new knowledge. Uh, all technology uh, only brings benefits if you can identify which limitations it removes from the system, which constraints it removes. And finally, uh, this nice little message from Mrs. Adam. Um, the message of all of this is unambiguously clear. If you want a team that learns, right, you want learning to happen, you need to understand that learning is a process with a history and a future. It is thus not containable within observable moments. Uh, 
single point metrics and thinking about you know what's happening right now as opposed to what just happened and what we want to happen uh, causes significant problems. Thank you. about yeah. Kevin to ask stupid questions. Excellent. Um, but I, I think at two points you kind of alluded to that like chaotic or acting first, and I think that last statement yeah. you said is a bad thing. Yeah. And I think operational, I think that's kind of wrong. Right. Because like things like we get into a mode where we know we need to kill something. Yeah. And that's chaotic, right? Yeah. It's, where it's, it's about practice. Yeah. When a practice, we don't have a clear definition yeah. of that practice. We need to figure out what quadrant we're in. Yeah. And so I, I think, I, I didn't think it, I don't know if you agree with me saying, like from a software development process yep. maybe, but from an operational perspective, I kind of like the idea of knowing when things are chaotic and, and we have a lot of history in operations. Absolutely, yep. uh, Circuit breaker yep. patterns, I mean, go on and on and on. So, so the way that I generally describe, so there's two versions of chaos and this is contentious even within the Kinevin community. Uh, and the one that I described is one that you never want to approach, which is being completely out of control, right? You just don't want to get there. Uh, there are shallow dips in the chaos, which are ways of like motivating change in thinking. Um, as a manager, the way that I try to describe chaos versus the other ones is uh, all managers have a gun, and they can kill things. And they should never kill things unless they're in the chaotic zone. In which case, exactly the way you're describing it. And really what it is is an attempt to get managers to think how to limit their use of guns to only chaos. <laughs> yes? And that's really, that's what I think the key of it is. Because in all the other ones, they should actually be making sure their gun is holstered. <laughs> <laughs> but again, limiting, I think, again, in an operation perspective, I think there's a beauty in understanding that you've been gone, Absolutely. gone by. So I, Absolutely. I think anything I would say, don't limit. I think, I think we just need to understand the practice. Yep. So uh, at some point, uh, I'll show you the, the, what we call the inauthentic versions, and then that will answer your question okay. more tightly. Thank you.